Thank you, Laila, for your introduction. And thank you uh, to Jane for organizing this uh, fascinating um, workshop. So before I, um, I delve into this mechanism called the Universal Periodic Review, I feel I need to say a few words about what this mechanism is about. So um, in 2005, the um, United Nations began a process um, of reforming its human rights uh, system. And this was in response to critiques according to which um, the um, Human Rights Council uh, had become politicized, that it tended to name and shame certain states while leaving others um, unscrutinized. And the Universal Periodic Review was a mechanism what, which was specifically designed in order to address uh, these critiques. So what is it? In fact, the Universal Periodic Review is um, a state-led state peer scrutiny by the community uh, of states of the human rights records of the, the 193 UN member states, which is carried out um, on a regular cycle of a four year uh, and a half. And this uh, mechanism is supposed to assess the um, extent to which states respect their uh, human rights obligations set out, set out in uh, first the UN, uh, UN Charter, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, human rights instruments to which the state is party, that is to say the different human rights uh, treaties uh, ratified by the states concerned, uh, voluntary pledges and commitments by, made by the states, and other applicable international humanitarian law. So it's a, a mechanism that is uh, composed of uh, four main stages. Uh, the first one is the preparation uh, of information for the review. It's a moment during which the state under review prepare its national reports. Um, and when NGOs and other stakeholders also prepare uh, documents, uh, when the uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, which acts as a secretariat of the mechanism, is also summarizing um, these NGO's contributions and is preparing a compilation of UN information. The second uh, part, which is um, the second stage, if you like, which is the most visible, uh, is called the uh, interactive dialogue. It's also called the working group, the review by the working group. It's this moment that takes place um, in Geneva, in Palais des Nations, in room 20, where the state under review presents uh, present its national report, and um, the UN member states uh, make question, uh, ask question and make recommendation that the state under review is free to reject or simply note. Um, and then the last, uh, the third stage of the mechanism is called the adoption of the reports. It's a few days after the review. It's the moment during which um, the um, state under review um, um, e explains um, in front of the working group which recommendations uh, it has uh, adopted, it has uh, agreed to implement. And finally, the fourth uh, stage is the implementation of recommendation before the next uh, review, uh, during which uh, actually uh, the stage of implementation is going to be evaluated again by the working group. Does it make sense? Yeah. So, um, so as I said, these reviews are based on, uh, on three key documents. Uh, one is the national report, which is prepared by the state and the review. Um, then there's a compilation of UN documents. It's also prepared by the Secretariat of the UPR. Uh, and it's a compilation, it's a document that is based on, uh, you know, information that can be found within the different um, UN uh, human rights mechanism as well as, as, well as the other uh, UN um, agencies. And finally, the summary of stakeholders' information, other stakeholders' of information, is a summary of the contributions, of the submissions that are um, sent to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, and it's a summary of 12 pages, uh, approximately. Um, okay, so this uh, presentation will focus on 
uh, this last type of documents and on NGOs' uh, submissions on which this summary is based. NGO submissions are um, distinct in a way from petitions in the sense that their objective is not solely to voice uh, the demands uh, of civil society's organizations, but also to share information on the human rights situation of the state and their review with other uh, concerned citizens, international civil servants and diplomats. So NGO submissions represent a specific form of claim making whereby an official or an officially recognized group uh, of civil society actors seeks to raise awareness on the situation of human rights in a specific country and seeks to attempts to encourage um, the world or the international community uh, to take concrete steps to redress the situation. So in this presentation I will pay specific attention uh, to the social life of these documents as they, are, as they circulate between NGOs' offices in various locations in the world um, and the uh, OHCHR uh, office uh, in Geneva. I identify the various types of addresses this submission seeks to seek to reach out, the social relations created via their circulation, uh, and the cultural and social capital that is mobi mobilized in the process of drafting uh, these submissions. And more specifically, I will um, highlight the translation work uh, carried out by uh, uh, the um, teams of drafters working at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. I intended to talk about also the work of brokers and translators that uh, international uh, NGOs uh, were, were playing, but I, I think I won't have time to, um, to, to discuss that, so I will focus on the Secretariat in this presentation. I also want to highlight or to underline the um, contradictory effects of knowledge practice forms of expertise and bureaucratic procedures on the articulation uh, of social criticism. And finally, I want to examine the forms of disciplines and modes of subjectivization, subjectivization generated by the bu bureaucratic modalities of civil society participation. I want to pay specific attention to the phenomenon of epistemic cap capture that occurs when um, UN drafters um, seize and take ownership of contentious information provided by NGOs. While such processes give this information, of course, legitimacy um, and value within the official discourse, which is um, um, actually uh, mostly um, a discourse, a dialogue among states. Um, they also distort ideas in a way that reduces their critical content and make them compliant with the dominant paradigm. So, um, as Laila already said, I mean, this, um, this uh, analysis is based on um, a one year fieldwork. Uh, uh, ethnographic study of the uh, universal periodic review that I carried out with Jane and it's also informed by this three months internship I was able to do in the context of this research at the office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, when I become part, became part of this team of drafters in charge of preparing these summaries of stakeholders uh, information and it's also informed more recently by a consultancy um, that I carried out with uh, Agathe here at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights where I was able to kind of follow up um, on the transformation of the methodology. Okay, so um, as I already mentioned, only uh, states can participate um, in uh, the public half-day review and speak during this uh, interactive dialogue. So the public reviews, which take place in, um, in this magnificent uh, room here, which is, I would say, I would call it the front stage of, of the mechanism, um, are only, I would say, uh, only the kind of front stage of, 
a plethora of other activities that take place you know, beyond uh, this room uh, in the corridors where diplomats negotiate the recommendation they will give to each other, but also, uh, I would argue, in the office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights where uh, drafters negotiate or decide or uh, take decisions on on which, um, you know, which information should be placed uh, in the summary of stakeholders. So the participation of NGOs uh, in the UPR has been a highly contested issue from the very start, uh, from the very first consultation carried out by the working group appointed to discuss the modalities of the mechanism back in 2006. And there were differences of view which were centered on the potential role of independent experts and NGOs and the sources of information on which the review should be based. So NGOs' participation was early on relegated to the backstage of the UPR. Um, and if they cannot um, take the floor during the interactive dialogue, they can intervene in a number of other ways. They can lobby states to take their recommendation on board. They can organize side events in parallel to each reviews. Um, they can participate in consultations organized by the state under review during the drafting process of the national report. Uh, they can follow up on accepted recommendation and they can submit information to um, the UPR secretariat. So information provided by uh, NGOs can be referred to by any of the states taking part in the interactive discussion. Um, and actually um, it's uh, this information, so this is, yeah, this is a team of intern at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And these are the various documents um, on which uh, the reviews are based. Yeah, and so this, um, this, um, yeah, I'll talk about that later on. So in the context of, uh, of this mechanism where um, their capacity to speak uh, is restricted, NGOs' concerns are primarily raised and voiced by others, that is to say, other states and uh, the um, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights via this summary. And because NGOs' voices are constantly mediated, their role within the UPR can be equated to the one of a ventriloquist. Um, that is to say that their relevance within um, the mechanism relies on their capacity to find a friendly mouth uh, able and willing to uh, speak their words. So, as I said, you know, this document called the Summary of Other um, Stakeholders' Information has been uh, called in that way in order to enable, uh, to broaden the scope of civil society participation. It was not a summary of NGOs' information, it was a summary of other stakeholders so that actually um, it could incorporate information sent by trade unions, lawyers, associations, small civil society organization. And during my field work at the OHCHR, for instance, um, I was told by one of my colleagues that an association of ex-prisoners in Singapore was not able to uh, registered, register as an NGO, but was able to actually um, register as a private company and therefore to submit uh, uh, a report uh, to uh, the UPR secretariat. Um, but if this uh, terminology has uh, broadened the scope of civil society uh, organization, uh, party participation, it has also left room for states uh, attempt at controlling or manipulating the content of the, these documents. And indeed, some uh, states have um, established governmental and uh, non-governmental organization. Uh, in UN jargon, we call them the gongos. Um, and these uh, governmental, non-governmental organizations are sometimes mobilized by states to send uh, reports to the secretariat, which actually uh, praise the state for its magnificent uh, performance in the field of human rights. So uh, Cuba, for instance, and Venezuela were two states which were kind of uh, expert in ma mobilizing their gongos for uh, the summary of their, uh, for their summary. Um, 
Cuba, for instance, during the first UPR cycle, sent, uh, received 350 um, uh, contributions from such gongers, which were not dismissed by the Secretariat, but which were, which um, you know, implied a lot of labor uh, to keep most of them, but also to cluster them and to kind of counterbalance the content of this submission with more critical sources of information, notably by international governmental organization. Another uh, type of actor which has been um, incorporated in the context of the UPR are the national human rights institution, uh, which are institutions which were um, kind of conceived in the context of the Paris uh, principle, which were adopted during the first international workshop on national institution for the promotion and protection of human rights, which was held in Paris in 1991. So it has become now a standard uh, to, um, for states to establish such national institutions. And of course, not all of them, um, I mean, there are various degree of independence from, uh, for each of these national institutions. And of course, states try to, you know, uh, I mean, these uh, institutions are supposed to be um, you know, the kind of guardians of human rights in a national context, but of course also states are trying to keep control on, you know, this kind of uh, self-surveillance mechanisms. But national human rights institutions are also part of these other stakeholders um, who are able to uh, submit uh, reports to the UPR secretariat. So I see that uh, everything is going very fast, so I have to... Um, um, so I want to talk about um, uh, NGOs' uh, submissions, um, and I want to talk about um, the administ administrative procedures which regulate um, these uh, reports. Um, because indeed these reports are summarized, but they can also be found uh, on the um, office of the High Commissioner of Hum for Human Rights uh, website. Uh, you can find them only if you know the little trick, which is to click on this little footnote here, where all of them are found. But it took me some time to realize that you can, could actually have access to them. Yeah. Um, sorry, it's here, a little footnote. Um, but uh, fortunately, there is a kind of a NGO watchdog of the mechanism called uprinfo.org, uh, which actually makes access to this contribution much easier. Um, here, you can find them just by clicking on these links. Actually, most uh, um, people who participate in the Universal Periodic Review find, find information on this website rather than the uh, website of the Office of the High Commissioner, which is a very messy website, even though it has improved since the first cycle. Um, so these submissions are addressing uh, various types of audiences. The civil servants of the OHCHR, of course, first, because they are the ones who will be responsible for drafting this 10-page summary. Uh, they are addressing the members of the working group who are responsible for offering a recommendation to the state under review during this uh, interactive dialogue. Um, they are addressing the representative of the state under review uh, for whom NGOs are supposed to act both as uh, watchdogs but also um, as an implementing partners. Um, and they are also addressing the broader uh, community of citizens concerned with the state of human rights in their country or in the world at large. So in order to preserve their credibility in a mechanism uh, dominated by states and to avoid retaliation, NGOs have to embrace the cooperative and non-confrontational spirit that is supposed to guide the universal periodic review. They therefore need to find a balance between denouncing human rights violations and offering the state under review constructive recommendations on how to improve the situation on the ground. Furthermore, to be considered for the summary, uh, NGOs reports have to follow a specific format and they have to comply with a range of criteria defined in the uh, Human Rights Council institution building package. And this 
um, criteria are mostly about word limits, so an individual submission by an NGO is limited to 2,815 words, including footnotes and annexes, and a joint submission submitted by a coalition of NGOs, that is to say two NGOs or more, uh, can reach uh, 5,630 words. Therefore, an NGO can submit only one individual uh, submission, but can be part of um, as many sub, uh, sub joint submissions as it wants. Yeah. So these constraints are related to reports length force NGOs to take strategic decisions on which issues to prioritize, especially if they want them to be reflected in the summary of other stakeholders' information prepared by the Secretariat. The word limit also pushes um, NGOs to focus on the formulation of action-oriented recommendations, since those are the elements that are the most likely to be um, picked up by the drafters and the recommending states. Such pragmatic considerations mean that little room is left really in these reports for uh, um, genuine engagements with contextual analysis on the root causes of violations. Many NGOs complained, in fact, that the summary drastically watered down their claims and read like an assortment of decontextualized sound bites without any distinct melody coming out of it. This impression was uh, reinforced by the fact that synthesizing NGOs' information is, in fact, prohibited. Um, uh, and that uh, so as to maintain, supposedly to maintain the principle of impartiality. So what the OHCHR has to do is to find the best quotes that represent the, be you know, the best the issues at stake in each of these reports and to simply copy and paste them in the summary of all the stakeholders. Um, so therefore these summaries are a collection of direct quotes extracted from uh, these reports, uh, all of them following the same um, disposition of paragraph and written along similar linguistic patterns such as X NGO notes that, Y NGO recommends that, and Z is concerned that, and that's, that's the way uh, it goes on. So no need to say that these reports are extremely boring to, to read. Uh, <laughs> So furthermore, UPR gives a, an impetus to, uh, to NGOs to write joint reports so as to ensure that their priorities are adequately reflected in uh, the summary. It encourages them to develop coalitions and to work together to identify, to identify uh, core claims. There are other uh, criteria for, uh, for um, to follow um, so that uh, to ensure that uh, NGOs report will be um, admitted by the Secretariat. Um, they have to be specifically tailored for the UPR, so NGOs cannot simply recycle reports that they have submitted for to other uh, UN mechanism. Even though they can draw inspiration from them, the information presented should follow the standard UPR format, that is to say, it should contain credible and reliable information on the human rights situation in the state under review, which means basically that, um, I mean, credibility and um, reliability are assessed by the Secretariat based on the first-hand nature of the information provided. Um, it should highlight um, main issues of concern and identify possible recommendation and best practices. Um, oh my God, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's impossible. Okay, so um, I'm going to skip that, but there are many other um, constraints, I mean, procedural constraints that uh, NGOs have to, have to follow. So now I'm going to talk in the five minutes that I've, are left about the role of the Secretariat because actually it's a, it's a key actor in the UPR and most, uh, most uh, actually studies of this mechanism tend to, um, tend to overlook uh, its role when I believe that it's, um, its kind of low profile uh, uh, enables drafters to actually shape the content of the discussion that take place in this room 20 uh, in Palais des Nations. Um, and it, 
it also I think has a very important role to play to in order to mediate um, um, NGOs claims right so this tension between this moral duty of protecting the voice uh, from the field and the necessity to preserve the credibility of the institution implies that drafters have to engage in a myriad of uh, bureaucratic procedures whose repetitive performance serve to maintain the principles of neutrality, objectivity, and transparency. And I have argued elsewhere that in spite of the tedious administrative procedures the production of document entails, the drafting involves intense discussions which are not deprived of affect and even of passion at times. This observation contrasts with the tenor of this interactive dialogue which um, in spite of its promising name does not provide very much room for interaction or genuine interaction since all, um, you know, all the states taking the floor actually reading statements. Um, so such negotiations, I realize, during my three months internship, take place off stage um, in the offices of the um, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, where drafters engage in vigorous debates over the content of a paragraph and take strategic decisions on which issues to prioritize. Since the first cycle of the UPR, the methodology used uh, for drafting documents has changed quite dra dramatically. At the time of my uh, first field work, um, in 2012, the draft drafting process followed an interdivisional methodologies that mobilized the knowledge and expertise of civil servants um, working in the four divisions of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, that is to say, uh, the uh, Research and Right to Development Division, the Human Rights Treaty Division, the Field Operation and Technical Cooperation Division, and the Human Rights Council and Procedures, Special Procedures Division. No need to say that the organigram has changed uh, since then, so, so it's uh, an old one. Um, and in each of uh, these divisions, uh, four drafters called UPR focal points under the supervision of one coordinator were in charge of gathering the information that was required for the division's input to the compilation. These teams of focal point worked in close collaboration with a team of drafters coordinators <coughs> located within the Human Rights Council branch. Uh, here, what did I do? Yeah, okay. Uh, here, uh, yeah, Human Rights Council branch responsible for collecting all the draft and finalizing the documents. This interdivisional methods uh, was had been put in place in order to avoid the personalization of documents and to prevent the association of a document with one specific uh, drafted. Um, and this strategy, I was told, protected anonymity, guaranteed objectivity, and enhanced the bureaucra bureaucratic legitimacy of the material produced. Because of their direct access to uh, geographic desk officers who were in regular contact with um, OHCHR staffs in the field, the uh, field operation and technical cooperation uh, division here uh, um, was uh, primarily responsible for the first draft of the summary of other stakeholders' information. However, the content of uh, this document was collectively assessed during weekly team meetings and ultimately during the meeting of the country consultative group, the CCG, which was uh, a meeting during which um, um, drafters decided together um, which issues were contentious um, uh, and, we, uh, and um, which um, during which they decided also um, how to maintain a balance in the type of issue presented between civil and political rights versus economic, social and cultural rights. Um, they also tried to ensure complementarity uh, and consistency between the summary and the compilation. Uh, and this meeting was really a strategic moment during which drafters decided on which issues uh, emphasis should be put. 
since the beginning of, uh, of the UPR, the drafting methodology has been the object of uh, heated internal debates, especially between managers who shared the view that uh, it mobilized too many internal resources and it was not cost effective. Um, and uh, drafters who, on the contrary, defended uh, the idea that the methodology guaranteed the quality of the information um, produced and it strengthened the links between the different UN human rights mechanism, which was initially uh, an objective of the UPR, um, which was originally conceived not as a means to duplicate uh, or replace existing mechanism, but rather as a means to reinforce cooperation between them. So actually the drafting of documents was a concrete way of creating these interactions between uh, the mechanisms. There was a big battle and eventually uh, the team of drafters was not able to convince uh, managers um, of the importance of maintaining this methodology and recently um, I learned that uh, the methodology had been changed and the, um, it, it, uh, um, it now, it, it's, it's now the responsibility of one drafter to produce documents for one country. Uh, the CCG meeting, the country consultative groups meeting, which were these strategic moments when drafters were able to you know, decide you know, which issues to prioritize, um, the, these meetings do not exist uh, anymore and it's the responsibility of each individual drafter to go and see the ver various focal points in the various divisions uh, to get the information he or she needs to put together this report. Um, the advantage of this methodology, according to a drafter interviewed recently, is that it enables drafters to uh, develop in-depth expert knowledge on the human rights situation in specific countries. She told me, now we are able to think about issues that really matter in each country. We can become experts of each country. However, the centralization of the drafting process also means that OHCHR divisions have lost ownership of document production and that individual drafters are accountable for the integrity of the information presented in each report. In other words, with the change of methodology, the meaning of document production has changed. It no longer serves to facilitate the sharing of information and the fostering of collaboration within the Office of the High Commissioner. Rather, it enables the concentration of knowledge in the hands of a small group of UPR experts. Furthermore, um, these uh, CCG meetings I talked about earlier, which had the ritual power of producing a community of international civil servants and experts bound together by the principle of impartiality and transparency, these meetings um, have, have disappeared. So the individualization of document production means that actually the UPR secretariat is now deprived from the technical means to make community, which is an element of, it, what's an element of its everyday work that gave meaning to drafters, otherwise highly tedious and burdensome, not to say boring bureaucratic task. So from keepers of the truth uh, in a Foucauldian sense, um, that is to say as the expert truth tellers bond together, um, bond to the ruler via a parasitic contract and discipline to mobilize specific knowledge practice in order to be acknowledged as legitimate truth tellers. Drafters have been turned into diligent bureaucrats able to produce documents on time and according to specific administrative rules and standards. The social dimension of their work has been partially eliminated in favor of efficient and productivity, uh, in according to criteria of efficiency and productivity. There is also in this process a loss of personal relationship with these NGOs. In the past, drafters were able to actually reach out to this small civil society organization and say, your contribution is great, but the language is not really right. Could, we just, could you just rephrase it a little bit so that we can incorporate it in the summary of stakeholders? These kinds of um, exchanges that used to take place during the first cycle of the UPR, not that often, but they nevertheless took place, do not uh, take place anymore and submissions are 
simply automatically rejected and dismissed. So to conclude, if you give me one more minute, um, what I wanted to say in my, uh, in my conclusion is that um, NGOs generally consider uh, their report successful when their recommendations are picked up by states and when uh, those are accepted by the state under review. But uh, recommendations that are not accepted can also be useful as they give visibility to contested issues. And what we've seen during the first cycle of the UPR is that actually the issue of sexual orientation and uh, gender identity has emerged in the UPR, even though most states have rejected these recommendations. But uh, it has kind of mainstreamed or created a kind of a, a field where it's possible to, uh, it's no longer seen as weird to, to talk about that in the context of a UN mechanism. So it has kind of, um, yeah, um, um, the repetition of such recommendation has normalized, has normalized discourses about sexual orientation. Um, so in the same way as the impact of scholarship is increasingly assessed according to quantitative criteria, that is to say the number of time an academic text is cited um, in other academic publications, the success of an NGO's report equally relies on it being referenced in other more powerful UPR documents, such as a summary um, of stakeholders, or in states' recommendation to the state under review. Um, and in, ultimately in the working group report, where all recommendations received by the state under review uh, are recorded. Citation is therefore the benchmark upon which NGOs' influence uh, is assessed. Uh, so NGOs' capacity to hold uh, the state into account primarily depends on their aptitude to convince international civil servants and diplomats that they represent a credible source of information that can be legitimately referenced. So in order to be received, perceived as such, NGOs have to adopt the language of the powerful. Uh, they need to embrace the bureaucratic logic of the UPR, its mode of address, its diplomatic etiquette, and its specialized jargon. Such cultural capital requires intense uh, socialization via regular attendance of reviews, trainings, and expert support. And actually, international NGOs have been you know, essential in guiding smaller local civil society organization in uh, the maze of the UPR and in socializing them into these bureaucratic modalities. So, so I would say that uh, the power of the, uh, of the UPR is its capacity to unmesh actors in its own logic in the process of, of participating in, uh, in this mechanism. And NGOs gradually learn to tailor the performance uh, according to the expectation of their audience and their comment of uh, administrative procedures is therefore essential to guarantee their relevance in a system whose primary task is to produce paperwork and make it uh, circulate in the world. And I will stop it here because I have too much to say. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.